exactly right. I did. I've been following top nonprofits for a while, along with um, a number of other kind of um, information consolidating sites. And um, having seen the agenda for this conference, it occurred to me that there there is something. There was something missing, and that was my um, claim, if you will, to Amy to say. You don't have to do this. You don't have to talk about NFTs and cryptocurrency and blockchain. However, um, given the trusted um, name that Top Nonprofits has in the sector, it felt important to me to include it because there is some reason to believe that this is going to be, and I say this, NFTs, cryptocurrency, and the use of blockchain are going to be big during this coming giving season. They'll be bigger next year, but even if um, for the eight, eight or nine people we have with us, even if your, uh, even if you choose for your nonprofits not to engage, not to engage in um, this online crypto giving or NFT alignment, um, it makes sense to know about it this year, so that you feel like a pro next year. <clears throat> Agreed. I couldn't agree more, honestly. Thank you, Amy. Rebecca, over to you. Okay, over to me. So hello, everyone. We are so excited to be here today to talk to you about what we believe are, as, as Wendy was sort of hinting at, frontiers in fundraising. So that's NFTs, cryptocurrency, and blockchain. Uh, we're from the nonprofit relations team at Doing Good, a soon-to-be-launched creator-first NFT platform that ensures that each and every transaction results in a donation to a nonprofit of the creator's choice. And amazingly, the best news of all, it's entirely free for nonprofits. Uh, my name is Rebecca Stokes. My background is in a lot of um, different sort of aspects of the charity sector, everything from sort of mental health to peace building to um, uh, youth development. And we are so excited to be here today. Um, all that's kind of left to me to do is to introduce Wendy a little bit. Wendy, do you want to give give us an introduction? You bet. So um, I'm an American living in London, in fact, now British as well. And um, I've been in kind of big business for the bulk of my career um, until I came to London and um, work with um, large multinationals um, in leadership development, organizational change, and um, decided to sort of make a change when I moved to London um, and worked for London Business School for a long time, again, uh, helping clients um, make notable organizational changes with leadership as the foundation. Um, and this is, um, over my entire career, the fourth startup I have joined. Amazing. Thanks, Wendy. And we are still a startup. That's, we are still in startup mode. I can happily say that. Yeah, very happily. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so... Moving on to our agenda for today. So here's what we're gonna talk about today together. We hope to give you a perspective on this rapidly emerging space. Some examples of our topic, actual NFT sales that have already taken place is our first point of call. Then we'll take a step back. We'll define our terminology, uh, blockchain, crypto, and NFTs. And now that we've made sense of, sense of uh, our key terms, now we ask how mainstream is this space? Is it, you know, is it mainstream or is it all just oddballs? Um, then we're going to talk about some commonly cited risks um, that are covered in the media and responses to these risks. And then um, we'll move into getting started and getting started in nearly no time at all, under an hour, um, ways in which that we, we believe are the best ways that you can do that. And then we've prepared key takeaways, which is a great launching pad for our discussion, where we'll take the time to kind of answer any questions you may have, as well as, um, uh, yeah, just basically any and all questions. And, and to be honest, we really do, the, the questions that we really welcome is kind of like, wow, why is the blockchain so amazing? Or where do I sign up? Or Wendy, what, what is your skincare routine? And you're glowing. I mean, these are the types of questions we want, but you know, any and all questions are, you know, welcome, I suppose. But yeah, <laughs> Wendy, over to you. <laughs> Okay. Um, so the, the place to start, um, Amy and I agreed that we would begin with um, an assumption of zero knowledge. And generally speaking, that's what we do in our organization, because we recognize there's a very small population that have been exposed to things like the blockchain and cryptocurrencies and NFTs. So with uh, 
with your spoken or silent approval, um, that's exactly where we're going to take you, the real life examples, uh, just to start at the beginning. So um, these are three, Beeple, Pac, and Blau. These are three famous NFT artists in this space. If, um, if you know this stuff, just hit us in the chat to say, got it. Or if you want it to us to slow down, go a little faster, go a little slower, just let us know. Um, again, as I said, I'm going to go on the assumption that you don't have any experience here yet. Um, these are uh, three examples of sales that, will, that were made. Um, and as you can see, Beeple sold this giant piece of about uh, 5,000 mini pieces all put together for 69 million. And it was sold, that's notable, it's real money, I get that. Um, and it was sold at Christie's auction house, not so you know, subtle a place and, um, and uh, it got a huge amount of attention. Um, and Pac also, I, I believe this, If I don't think we have the, the video embedded, but I believe this square rotates, which NFTs can do. And then Blau, who is a electronic music producer, um, sold a large number, I would say, a large number of digital albums for what I would say is a lot of money. Um, and so that was music that's inside those NFTs. So those are real live NST, NFTs that have been created and have already been sold. So it's not just individuals who are in this NFT spaces, it's also big name celebrities and large brands. Uh, Will Smith, whether we wanna call him a celebrity or a brand, it's really your choice, but he's well into the space as are the artists who do takes on the celebrities. Um, in the middle, that's Grimes. And um, she's, she's both artistic, of course, and uh, musical. And so she sold some of her art here. And some of the NFTs that were sold, that Grimes, I think she brought in around 5 million with her NFT sales. Some of them also included bits and pieces of unre unreleased recordings that she had. So people who bought her NFTs also got almost a secret stash of music that hadn't been released anyplace else. And then you may know, this is probably, it's a guess on my part, but I think this is the best known NFT marketplace, and that's NBA Top Shot, Basketball, National Basketball Association. And on that website, if you haven't seen it, it is the, um, it, um, it is the probably the um, pace setter for NFT marketplaces. Inside, they have all sorts of memorabilia that you would get if you were to go to an NBA game and go to a shop. Trading cards of the players. You can buy favorite moments on video. You can buy um, moments with your favorite players. And um, that's, that's a really big one. They are super successful and spent about, I think the, the, the news about them says they spent about two and a half years developing that site. And then there've already been a couple of real life fundraising successes. So uh, it may be that people in crypto have a notion that they've become very lucky and it's time to engage in some real philanthropy. And we've seen that open earth um, Freedom of the Press Foundation and Los Angeles Homeless, although the name of the organization isn't attached um, to that particular one on the right, have all been huge beneficiaries of uh, NFT creators, artists, um, influencers, if you will, who chose to create an NFT, particularly for the purposes of giving away the proceeds to um, to a, a nonprofit or a, a bunch of nonprofits. Thank you, Rebecca. Amazing. So yeah, so um, now we get to get into the, the meat of the discussion. Let's start making sense of some of the terms that you may have heard kind of floating about. So uh, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and NFTs, they each describe a different part of this new record keeping system. So I'll go over each of these in depth, um, but as a sort of overview, you can imagine blockchain is kind of like the record keeping system. Cryptocurrencies are the money that's used in this new record keeping system. And NFTs are the things that you buy and you sell with your cryptocurrency and the blockchain will then 
keep a track of all of it. Um, so yeah, so let's let's uh, dive into this a little bit deeper. So what is blockchain? It's a decentralized ledger. That's the headline. What does it record? It records every single transaction across a peer to peer network of computers. And this is kind of in contrast to a, a, a centralized system, um, which has um, a specific intermediary. Um, so there are things you can do in a decentralized systems that are not possible in the centralized ledgers currently controlled by centralized powers such as banks uh, and companies. So blockchain presents many widespread societal applications to areas not limited to, um, I think we have some there, so we have voting, um, uh, direct payments, as well as even energy management. So uh, let's have a look at how they compare these sort of centralized and decentralized systems. Um, so here we're comparing blockchain to traditional centralized systems in the banking space. So I want you, I want you to be able to see uh, why people might choose a new system. They have all of these centralized systems. They've been working for so long. Why would you, why would you ever go anywhere else? Um, first and foremost, this is a battle between transparency and opacity. Um, I want to draw your attention to sort of three points of difference. We have a, I have a few there, but I want to draw your attention to three. The first is there is no single intermediary. So there's no one single person versus in centralized systems, you have managers as an intermediary. Uh, the second point is the blockchain is accessible to everyone versus I think what's there is it's only accessible to select customers and you have to go through different criteria to, to basically access different, your, your, to access an account. Um, and finally, I think a really important uh, point here is you only pay for what you use within blockchain, uh, as opposed to in centralized banking systems where layers of fees are charged and to no real, the, the purpose of which is kind of, is, is opaque and it's unclear sometimes to the user. So the overall impact of this, the combined power of all these amazing, amazing sort of things that we, we attach to the blockchain is um, that individuals rather than subjective institutions have greater power and authority over their financial well-being. Um, so now that we can each access, you know, using the blockchain, now that we can each access and keep track of our own transactions with this decentralized ledger, now, how are we going to buy and sell things, you may ask. And if you are asking that question, I will answer that question. And the answer is cryptocurrency. So cryptocurrency is an alternative to your standard uh, government issued money. It's how we exchange value within the blockchain and it's created and, ex and it's also stored electronically. So there's no physical thing. You're not getting any cash. It's, it's all in the blockchain. Um, it's made using a very high level of encryption. And um, there are you know, a lot of different um, crypto coins floating about. Um, I think we have three listed there. Bitcoin, Ether and USDC are just um, the most well known. Um, I would say, and, and more are being invented daily, many just for fun. Um, if you're wondering if you can create a crypto coin, the answer is yes, no one can stop you even if they should. Um, they should. So <laughs> maybe they should, I don't know, Dogecoin, who made that, do you know what I mean? Um, okay, so we have our digital ledger, blockchain to track every transaction. We also have our new money, cryptocurrency that we can use to buy and to sell things. But now what can we buy and sell, I think? is definitely a question I can hear is happening. Um, and the answer is NFTs. Now, NFTs, um, again, stop me from going too fast, but I'm just gonna throw all this at you and you can all ask questions, uh, questions when, when, as and when they pop up. But yes, NFTs, they are an acronym for what is called a non-fungible token, which is a, certifi a certificate of authenticity that's attached to um, or assigned to a bundle of two things. So the first, is an asset of some kind. So whether that's digital or physical. And the second thing that the NFT encompasses is uh, it's contained within the NFT and it's called a smart contract. Um, and that's what sort of governs the, governs the NFT. Now, um, the way that we can kind of think about this, uh, NFTs are ownership of collectibles that you can buy, sell, trade, and the smart contract enables um, lifelong royalties. So it takes all of the sort of ambiguity out of systems that have existed for quite a long time, all contained within the smart contract and, and transparently sent to whoever um, it's, it's contained within the, con the smart contract to, 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 for, the, for it to go to. Mm. Okay, so a brief recap. So blockchain, recording uh, keeping system, 
cryptocurrencies are the money that's used um, in this new record keeping system. And NFTs are the things that you buy and sell with your cryptocurrency and the blockchain will keep track of all of it. I hope that made a little bit of sense. <laughs> so uh, it did. It's a lot to take in, but it <laughs> made some sense. Um, and given that all these um, new terms, these new technologies um, uh, are, they're, they're interwoven. So you can't just talk about one thing. And the question is, are they exclusive to a very small group? Are there just a bunch of um, very clever Stanford graduates working with this stuff in Northern California? Um, or is this stuff mainstream? And it's a reasonable question uh, and we ask it a lot. So what we realize uh, when we step back and take a look at the entire sector or space as it's often called, is that it's already being built out by no surprises, um, the folks who manage the financial services and the consulting firms in particular, who are always the first to jump into a new sector. As you can see in industry, um, IBM both accepts cryptocurrency, it has cryptocurrency, if I'm not mistaken, on their balance sheet, and they have a massive crypto and blockchain practice, consulting practice, as does PwC. Um, Microsoft, the same. Uh, Starbucks takes cryptocurrency as payment, uh, as does Sotheby's, as does Coca-Cola in some of their vending machines. Um, in the payments or financial services spaces, you can see, you know, frankly, there's no there's, there's no way to know where Amazon won't go, whether that's a blockchain or a cryptocurrency and token um, or NFTs. Now that we understand they're going into healthcare, there may be no limit to uh, where Amazon takes its brand and its, um, and its promise. Taxbit is a, um, a uh, tax software like, um, like Intuit to automate um, the preparation of taxes for those who hold cryptocurrencies. You recognize maybe some of the wallet names, Revolut and Venmo. Visa is now going very big into the space. NFT marketplaces, we are doing good at the bottom there. Uh, we're one of many right now. We are pre-launch, so we're actually not one of many. <laughs> we're, we're one of the ones that's pre-launch. And then in the charitable sector, you may also know um, that, for instance, Malala Fund, Save the Children, United Way, American Red Cross, Salvation Army, and many, many others um, accept cryptocurrency donations online. Um, the Better Business Bureau, uh, probably one of the most trusted names in America, um, has launched a um, crypto giving site of its own called Give safely.io. And, um, and then there are third party services that are helping nonprofits take some of the complexity out. And uh, a very prominent player in the space is called the Giving Block. We have a partnership with them. And there are multiple that do that as well. So it's a pretty well uh, built out space. Um, thank you. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's not completely locked and loaded, this space, this sector, um, this industry. And uh, so it makes sense to kind of step back again and take a critical eye. So we've talked about the promise, the size of it, the fact that it's pervasive throughout society to a degree, and that there, there's a lot of money floating around. Um, so the question is, is it all um, kittens and apple pie? and roses. Um, so let's take a critical view of that and look at some of the risks and the responses to those risks. Um, the first risk or the, the, the thing that um, concerns or, or um, skeptical folks say, let me say it's a, it's a skepticism and it's a healthy skepticism, is that art NFTs are a passing fad what's the point of getting into it if, it's, if the fad is going to pass? So there's two parts to that. When I think about the response to that particular risk or concern, there are two parts to it. And Rebecca, I'm just going to give you a headline um, for the next few slides. We probably have a total of about six or eight minutes to get to the end. So if you want to figure out <laughs> which parts are your favorite and go with those, go for it. 
um, there's two parts to NFTs are a passing fad. One is that the art world has told us, and you can see some quotes here from the Hermitage in, in Russia, as well as the uh, Museum of Modern Art in uh, New York, that have said basically NFTs have changed the art world and museums forever. So we have reason to believe that um, the that NFTs and art aren't going to go away. But there's also reason to believe that NFTs themselves are not a passing fad. And one of the reasons for that is that NFTs are in their infancy, meaning it's not just a, a, a flat JPEG that one can put inside an NFT with a smart contract that governs its use. But in fact, all of these use cases, as we say, all of these uses of NFTs are coming online. Um, and that means moving videos, songs, music. Um, we can put inside an NFT um, uh, a dinner with your favorite celebrity. And when you want the dinner, you sort of cash in your token, but you get to keep it as proof that I had dinner with my favorite celebrity. Really, anything can go inside an NFT. And the, the point is that the, the benefits that come from NFTs, which are contracts that are immutable, nobody can mess with them. And royalties for resale that go on, these are all things, proof of authenticity, that make NFTs really valuable and will continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, a second risk that we sort of come up against quite a lot, and it's often mentioned in the media, is energy consumption. And I think a couple of you had questions about this prior to the prior to the talk. Energy consumption of what? Let's understand this risk a little more. Well, it's the computational energy required um, to power the distributed ledger that you saw a few minutes ago, the blockchain. Um, so what's the scale of this concern? Let's have a, have a quick uh, deep dive into what uh, Professor Brian Lucy of Trinity College Dublin says. So he's, he says, uh, Bitcoin alone consumes as much electricity as a medium-sized European country. This is a stunning amount of electricity. So alarming, right? But how should we think about this? Um, the energy consumption uh, was not a feature. Oh, sorry, was not a bug. It was an actual feature. Um, and here's what I mean by that. It was a deterrent against hackers who would need to organize a huge number of computers and people to hack into the Bitcoin and blockchain system. But that was then in 2012. However, as this industry grows up, things are changing dramatically. As you can see on the side, um, we have a couple, a couple of uh, things that have, we can see um, emerging in this space. There's already been a redesign of how the ledger is processed decreasing the consumption, as you can see there, by more than 99%. Um, beyond that, only um, there's systems by which uh, NFTs are only processed when they know they will sell. So again, decreasing the amount of use, uh, NFTs that aren't used on the chain and therefore decreasing the energy consumption. As Wendy mentioned earlier, with the uh, Open Earth Foundation NFT, artists and creators themselves are actually taking steps to reduce energy consumption through things such as carbon neutral um, NFTs. Um, and we need to start using this blockchain for good. Um, so all of this is to say the tech inside the blockchain crypto and NFT space is increasingly robust and sophisticated. The energy consumption profile is already better than what it was even if we compare it to a year ago. But you may ask, what is this building towards? Why should we continue to invest, build, mature the next versions of the blockchain, blockchain system? And the reason, the reason we think it's worth it is because of the benefits that it brings and the opportunities are, are absolutely enormous. Um, so I'm a little conscious for time. I think I might jump to the next slide there, Wendy. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. just share the point on, yeah. um, on 18 because it's, it's, it's relevatory. Some, yeah, I, I really want to get to it. Like, yes, yeah, so yes. And we we are, you know, one organization that we think is sort of ahead of this curve that really understand the opportunities that blockchain presents is funnily enough, you can have a guess in the chat, but it is actually the United Nations. Now, this might surprise you. It certainly surprised us to a degree. Um, and we're gonna kind of share two points with you from the UN. So um one second here now. Um, okay, so first, the UN considered the issue of the energy consumption profile 
of um, blockchain and has arrived at this conclusion that you can see on the slide. So UN experts believe that cryptocurrencies and the technology that powers them, blockchain, can play an important role in sustainable development and actually improving the stewardship of the environment. One of the most useful, and here's a really pressing point, one of the most useful aspects of cryptocurrencies, as far as the UN is concerned, is transparency. Um, yes. So even, you know, that would be enough, I think, but they've, they've gone even further. So more to this point, the US and UN has indicated that it believes blockchain and crypto can actually contribute to improving, not just preserving our, our climate, but but improving global climate protection outcomes. So they've stated blockchain could be, and I quote, of great benefit to those fighting the climate crisis and help bring about a more sustainable global economy. Uh, shown here actually with the, the infographic is a few of their ideas on how blockchain can actually be used in the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, it's a, in reference to a report that I actually really re recommend you all reading. <laughs> mm. um, I'm gonna take the next two. Um, I think those are the big ones. I, you know, Amy and I talked about this, um, that there is a, a strong belief because there's strong coverage in the media that, um, that maybe crypto is all about um, scammers and criminals. Um, so there are scams and there are criminals. Um, I guess it's important to put it into context because it's a set of innovations and would we kill innovation because there are bad players and there's some bad behavior. We do know that all fiat or government issued currencies like US dollars and, and pounds, where Rebecca and I happen to be in the UK, um, are also subject to bad behaviors and, and criminal behavior. So cash as well as crypto is subject to this bad behavior. Um, there are very high level players who are careful um, and we recommend uh, basically only aligning yourself with organizations that comply with the highest level of demands of uh, all aspects of the U.S. government, which includes the FTC and the IRS, that includes all organizations that pay taxes, that do all their correct filing. Um, and that is one way to reduce one's own exposure to some of these more uh, unsavory elements. And then uh, I'm just going to say, you could, that's fine. I'm yeah, just going to say, you're fine on four. Uh, say here on risk three, as well as risk four, you must do your own due diligence. This is an organization, uh, rather a, a, a sector in its infancy. And that means to play in it, one has to do a little more um, due diligence to make sure you have a good sense of what's going on and that all the rules that you would expect to be followed are being followed. And the last risk uh, or, or concern I'm gonna, uh, we're going to address here is that, um, that maybe this whole cryptocurrency NFT thing is really only for the big guys like the Malalas and the uh, uh, Save the Children and United Way. Or maybe it's only for the small ones who don't have the hangover of our very heavy board requirements. Um, and really all, all Rebecca and I wanna say is organizations of all sizes, NPOs of all sizes, of all scales, and in many, many different geographies, ultra local to multinational can engage in this space. Um, and we have some suggestions about some ways that can make it a little bit easier. We'll see if we can finish up in the next two minutes. So the, the next question is how to get started. And the answer is get started. Um, I think it was Maureen Mahoney Hill um, who said the best way to get started is to get started um, and to just start doing things. And we feel the same way. The, the, uh, and again, this is not financial advice. We can't make any guarantees, but um, you can... Uh, oh, Lori, thank you for putting your camera on. Um, <laughs> you can get started in under an hour. You can open a crypto wallet. There are no contractual obligations to it. There is no cost to it when you've chosen uh, the safer partners. You can open a, an exchange account at a cryptocurrency exchange that moves cryptocurrency into fiat or US dollars, if you will. Um, and you can connect those to your own bank account. Um, it doesn't have any requirements. There's public keys and crypt cryptography in place. Um, 
but we also suggest you kind of look at where your donors are and where the donor segments are that you think would have an interest in the impact you create with your programs. So get connected with those and just start trying stuff in very, very small, little, tiny, safe experiments. Go ahead. Um, one way to get started with NFTs is to um, join us at Doing Good. You can't do it yet, we're pre-launch, uh, but we appreciate that you might want to at some point. Um, we're a little bit different from the other NFT marketplaces in that with Doing Good, each and every NFT sale from a creator results in a donation, a contribution to a nonprofit of the creator's choice. So each and every sale, because what we're trying to do is move giving and sharing access and democracy to an everyday, every moment kind of experience. So um, it's, it's kind of our it's it's our jam. That's 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 what we're in the business for to give creators opportunity, and um, we have some very very ambitious um, founders. Uh, and this is our massive transformative purpose. Until every we won't stop building until every expression of human creativity builds a better world. Uh, there's some points of differentiation we can talk about. Oh, who doesn't love talking about the flow of money? We can talk about that if there's a question. I just want to go to the key takeaways, Rebecca, and then yeah, we have nine minutes for questions. Thank you so much. No worries. So the, the key takeaways um, are the definitions of blockchain is the ledger, crypto is the money or the medium of exchange, the money, and uh, the NFTs are these special digital assets with a wrapper of a smart contract that, that controls what happens to it. NFTs are very popular already. They're not fully mainstream. Not all parts of the country in the US will have knowledge or access yet, um, but it's there. Uh, there are some risks and areas of concerns, many of which are being addressed. Um, each person, of course, an organization needs to make its own set of decisions about whether they've been addressed adequately yet. Um, and getting started is something we would encourage you, small scale experiments. Um, and if you wanna connect with us, we would love to talk more about it. That's the end. I'm going to exhale for a second and invite you to ask some questions. So while people are getting their questions ready, I just wanna jump in. Um, thank you for this. This is, I found this to be very helpful. Um, I, I had all of those terms confused in my brain, and now I have a better understanding of what they are. And so um, I think that's helpful and I hope others feel the same way. And it was really interesting to see some good examples. So folks, if you have some um, questions, you can either directly message, oh, here we do have a question. Um, do you mind explaining again, some examples of NFTs? Yeah. Um, what do you think would be useful, Wendy? Will I jump back to that slide? I think so. Yeah, okay. Let so right now, NFTs are um, a JPEG file, like a picture you would send to your sister or mom, and then a little smart contract that says um, only um, uh, every time this picture is sold, 5% goes to United Way. And when you create the NFT on a browser, um, it gives you the opportunity, wherever you are, to say 5% on every time this is resold goes on. These trading cards are NFTs. Mm. So uh, whoever was kind enough to ask a question, ask us a follow-up question so we can get to the part that's most confusing for you. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so I'm looking for that. Um... If you, Julie, if you want to send it If you it want in. to, Julie, you don't have to. And then, yeah. it, I mean, even any reactions would be really, I'm really curious about any reactions you have to what you've seen and if you have experience in it. Um, so are all NFPs digital artwork? Are all or NFTs, NFTs digital? Sorry. Yeah. I was, that's what happens when I'm reading it and I'm not thinking. <laughs> Okay. Are all NFTs digital artwork? Thank you. Uh, Do you want to take this Rebecca? 
Okay, okay yes. <laughs> uh, so the short answer is no. Um, I think probably a lot of what you might encounter in the NFT space is artwork. Um, a lot of the NFT space currently is artwork and trading cards. So like your more standard collectible type stuff. But in and of itself, NFTs don't have to be anything to do with artwork. They can be literally anything. All an NFT is, is a sig- uh, as it says here on the slide, a certificate of authenticity that's attached to any kind of asset. It just so happens that the art space is one of the biggest, one of the spaces that is absolutely running with this because it provides so much renewed transparency, uh, ownership, financial agency to the space where it it didn't really have that before, if that makes sense. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mimi. If there are any other questions, um, please, you can share. Thank you. Um, are all NFTs non-tangible? All NFTs are um, electronic yeah, and digital, so they're not tangible. And all NFTs are also, I think I hear in that question, non-fungible. So in case you were asking both of those questions about tangibility, can you touch it? No, because it's electronic. Um, like a like a streaming streaming a song you can't touch it it's it's electronic it's digital and it's also non-fungible meaning it's unique Mm -hmm. and if we put two nfts next to each other one's a song one's a digital artwork they're not exchangeable they're unique they're special in their own way and that's what makes them i guess by definition non-fungible there is a question. Um, I know you touched on it earlier, so but to be specific, and you have a couple of minutes to answer this, David Suzuki Foundation has called launched um, has launched a fifty billion dollar NFT, calling in attention to the environmental costs of NFTs. Can you respond? I don't know how to unpack that. I'm not familiar with these. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm just trying to figure out where you're reading this from. Is it on Whova? It's a direct message to me from Perfect. somebody in the okay. audience. Yes. Um, will you read it again? Yes. And to the person who sent it to me, if I'm not reading it properly, feel free. You can even unmute yourself if you want to ask the question. Um, Sure, David. I'll unmute myself. There we go. So um, on the davidsuzuki.org, uh, he's created a nature-friendly token. Um, and it has it is for um, the equivalent of, it's, I think it's 25 million F, so Canadian 50 billion, to draw attention to the destructive environmental impact of proof of work blockchain activity. So I apologize if this is uh, repeating your slide about um, how the environmental costs are improving, but I'd love some detailed information about that. We're an environmental organization and I'd love to do something like this, particularly with indigenous um, communities, but obviously the environmental cost is a massive detraction for environmental yeah. orgs. It's a great point, Laurie, and I, and I appreciate it. I don't exactly know what David's doing. I can't quite decipher what the relationship is between wanting to draw attention to the uh, energy consumption and carbon footprint and the 50 million. But let's put that aside, and I'm not going to comment on that because I don't understand what exactly he's doing, but let's just get to the question um, that Rebecca covered, which is this, this concern about energy consumption. Um, The first iteration of Bitcoin and blockchain was incredibly consuming. And this quote from the professor is just one of a hundred articles you can find that makes reference to the amount of energy, computing energy required. um, I see the time. Computing energy required to do um, validation in in a method called proof of work. And so what's changed is very few will, uh, very few transactions on the blockchain will use this proof of work energy sucking approach within months. And if that month is six or 12, I'm not sure, but everybody is moving away from proof of work because it uses um, hundreds and hundreds of, uh, it uses me- mega gigawatts 
there's a new method called proof of stake. And proof of stake, as Rebecca mentioned, cuts down on the energy consumption for each transaction to a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. And we would expect as the industry matures that every aspect, even that tiny percentage left, will continue to be uh, iterated with new technologies and new approaches that continue to bring down both the economic and the carbon cost of running uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, programs on the blockchain. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. And sorry, I made you repeat it. <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. This this is a uh, it's new for everyone. You know, and we all uh, learn a lot by discussing it. So I appreciate you bringing it back. Yeah, yeah I'm glad. So thank you, Laurie. For thank you. Thank you so much, Amy, for inviting us, and thank you each of you for joining and for um, participating with us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Look forward Rebecca. to hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.